So, yeah, man, last time we ended up talking about some, something different, which was great. I appreciate it. Oh, no, but, me too, man. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that would be a great, one of the great, greatest episodes ever. It would be, it would go along as that. Um, Excellent. But today I want to, um, I'm going to try my best to save your time as well. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about confidence first. Okay. Uh, you have written a book about it, um, and I would like to know first um, before you even define what it is, or maybe you should start with a definition of what confidence means. Um, is the in in the book you said it's the belief to to trust yourself, right? Self trust. Yes, exactly. And then I wonder at what point did you, because I think confidence is one of those things when you developing, you know, whether you're growing up you don't really realize or even consider or talk about them, right? At what point did you question your own confidence um, while you were growing up and say, I actually need to work on this? Um, you know, growing up, I didn't really have it or have to because I grew up with, a, I'm, I'm a weird case, right? I grew up with a very fixed mentality. If you're not familiar with fixed versus growth mentality, I grew up thinking that what I had was what I had, kind of. And ability-wise, that's what I had to work with. So I had to believe I was I was a smart kid because anything else was not going to get me any, any further in life, right? And then I, I encountered very real problems when I started to, to do work that was hard for me. And that came early because I didn't really know how to sit down and do work. Now, this is key. Right. Uh, I didn't I, I had a very tough time in high school, certainly the, the second half of high school because of that. And then that continued into the rest of my life for a long time. And I didn't switch to a growth based mindset, a mindset where I could feel myself working through different, more difficult things to become more confident until I started boxing. And boxing helped me so much because I watched myself go from this awkward guy who was starting a sport late, who had like no natural ability whatsoever to go on and uh, to get a national title as an amateur and get sponsored and have a pretty good professional career, all of these things. And so I'm, I'm watching my body go from, from like nothing to something, you know, lethal and, and skilled and agile. And I said, wow, I built that. Like, it wasn't just bestowed upon me. It wasn't a gift by any means. Uh, I worked hard for it and brought it together. And so I took that mindset and I used it also when I went back to school for physics because I, I because math was that first thing I encountered that was super difficult where I was like, all right, I'm going to give it up. You know, no, no, nothing for me, right? And then I go and after boxing, I said, okay, if I did this for my body, can I do the same thing for my mind? And I sat there and I focused and I put the work in and it happened. So I watched my confidence build. I mean, I, I don't think, here's what I think. I don't think you can call yourself confident until you encounter something that forces you to be confident, that forces you to dig deep and go, okay, I have to bet on myself to improve. I have to bet on myself to get better. And if I don't do that, I'm going to fail, you know? That, that's just the reality of it. And that's what it came down to for me. First, it were these, these gradual little introductions into the sports and then in my academics. And then after that, I'm like, wow, I did this, man. Come on. What else can we do? Let, let's, let's write some stuff. Let's, let's grow a website. Let's try and make money online. And now I'm so confident in anything I put my mind to, not because I was born with some great gift of confidence. No, I built myself up from the from the ground. And I think that's where we become confident. We get our experiences, uh, we get we get, I guess, a memory, a memory of uh, what it's like to not be good. And then a memory of what it's like to be good. And then that path along the way we remember what we put in to get there. And you know, there you have it. I think that's how you build confidence. So there is an interview uh, online of you discussing the concept of red pill uh, in related to the, the idea of confidence as well. As a man, um, from that perspective, how, did you, how was your confidence just without any, say, physical abilities before? 
How can you uh, relate to that at the time? Yeah. Uh, nah, man. Like I, I said, I, I, I used to say, okay, so it's funny. I say I'm lucky now in life, right? Mm -hmm. And I used to say I was lucky then, but it was more like I'm lucky I wasn't born with some type of defect or something to hold me back. Mm -hmm. I didn't have – what I had was pretty much – uh, um, what I thought was given to me, and and that was it. And I wasn't really. Uh, you want to talk about pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone to get better? I felt like I was naturally extroverted, but to put myself up against something hard and see how that was going to work out for me, I didn't feel like I did any of that. So, so I think as a man, uh, part. I, in fact, I think one of the defining characteristics of being a man is to do that kind of thing habitually, habitually mm -hmm. step outside of your comfort zone, habitually push into in areas where you don't think you can make it and see where you go. Right. And I think one of, if you want to talk about like a rite of passage, right. I, I think my rite of passage into adulthood didn't happen until I was 27. When, when I, when I stopped drinking and simultaneously joined the military, well not, well, not simultaneously, close enough, because that was the first time that I went and, and enrolled in school all that. I did a bunch of things where it was like, yo, if you don't get this right, there's going to be a real dire consequence. And I had to go, okay, well, as, as a man, my back is against the wall. Maybe not for, like, I don't have any kids for myself. And now that I, I feel confident that I can carry myself to any difficulty because I got through that point in my life. I had no money. I was freaking, you know, basically I mean, an addict. It sounds weird to say that and hard to say that, but, but yeah, I had a, a terrible relationship with alcohol. I feel a lot better saying that. I had a terrible relationship uh, with alcohol and my priorities were completely out of whack. I had no money and I was basically, and I was effectively homeless and, and until a friend of mine helped me out and let me stay at his place. And I had to work and get myself and build myself up. And when you, when you do that kind of thing, uh, you're forced to look at yourself, like you say, as a man and go, man, you're not, you're not anything, man. You don't have anything going for yourself. And then to get stuff going for yourself to be a man, that's a really good feeling. And, <laughs> And you can't you, you can't buy that feeling, man. You you cannot manufacture it. Uh, that that kind of confidence that, that I think is essential to manhood. That, that it comes from so the, the, there is a there's this thing on the internet going on. Um, you know, it's kind of I think it's a self development for men. Yeah, right. It's kind of a big thing now. You know, where you you have a lot of guys maybe who don't have the drinking problem. They have careers but that they just don't feel enough about themselves. Ah, you know, yeah. They have, they have the mental abilities, sometimes even the physical ability, capabilities, but they just don't feel enough about themselves. You know, um, there are words like, you know, incels, so-called incels, I think they use that word, to identify them. It's kind of a big thing online when you read. I mean, and then there's MGTOW. It's kind of subgroups that men have created for themselves. Kind of, I don't know if they support groups. Yeah, all these different groups. They're, they're, yeah. they're <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, that they're, is, they're, they're different groups, you know. I think there's a, there's a, there's a, I don't know, there's a, a it's a conf, it could be a confidence problem, but there is an underlying problem here where uh, there's a certain men are uh, struggling to become, to feel enough of themselves. What do you, what do you think the problem is? And how can, you, how, how can you develop that kind of confidence? Because you have seen people like Jordan Peterson, they have become very popular simply because, you know, their content is being re relatable to a lot of men. And for someone maybe who, you know, have their life together, uh, his content might come off as average. But if he's cranking all right. the numbers that he has, you'll be, you'll be surprised that, hey, why are guys, so many guys following him? Meaning that there is a problem. There is definitely a problem. And let me tell you what the problem is, man. Uh, I don't know. Have you seen The Matrix, The Matrix movie? Yes. Okay, so there's a really, I mean, first of all, it's, it's brilliant for, for, for so many reasons. Forget the kung fu uh, and the guns, but the philosophy. And there is a wonderful scene in that movie. He talked when, when Agent Smith is trying to crack the codes from Morpheus. Yeah. And he says, he says to him, he goes, you know, the first program, was a it was a utopia. The first Matrix was perfect, but you guys rejected it. 
Like you didn't know what to do. You didn't have any problems. And, and that always stuck with me. And this really seems to be uh, the case that we're facing today. We have effectively conquered this planet, right? Like there are some things we can't do. There's still like one or two things that'll kill us that we're not uh, expecting. But for the most part, challenges us. We, are, we don't have to go hunt our food. We don't have to worry about staying warm. It, sickness should not kill anyone born healthy, right? It, it, it's, it's a very easy, not only have we conquered the things that would force us to develop kind of, you know, force us to be strong and force us to be hardy. We actually have another enemy that a lot of people don't think about, and that's that it's so easy to be comfortable and distracted. Like, like if you if you really wanted to just be be satiated and content, you could just sit in your apartment, watch Netflix, watch porn, and if porn's not enough, swipe on Tinder and, and find some other some local girls. We don't have any challenges. And people are very, and, and, and it's a double-edged sword. People res, are, were conquering kind of like species, man. We need stuff to, to push against us for us to push back so we can become strong and develop, right? With that said, uh, we, we, we don't really like it, right? <laughs> it's just kind of that thing you have to do. So when you're presented with the, the alternative, which is, okay, do I, do I go bust my ass at the gym for two, for an hour to a night? Or do I come home and watch the, and binge watch the latest series on Netflix with, with, with some cheap beer and processed food? Food that like, I mean, th think about that. Most of human history, what I just said wasn't even possible for you to come, for you to just have food on demand, refrigeration. Come on, that's crazy, right? But we have that and it's made us so weak. And here's the problem. We don't do well that way. We, we, need, to, we need to be developed. And when we don't develop, uh, we, we look for things to attack. We look for things to, to beat down and feel bad. There's a book I'm reading. Well, I just finished it called The Epidemic of Absence, and it's about food allergies. And the basic thesis of this book is that food allergies have evolved because the environment we grew up in or, or the humans developed in uh, was so dirty and so disgusting that our immune system had to work overdrive to keep us alive. Well, now it's so clean that the immune system is like, well, what do I do? I mean, there's nothing for me to kill. I don't know, right? And, and it doesn't taper down like you would think. No, it just turns on stuff that's harmless, like peanuts and fish and milk and eggs. And it's like, well, I'll get that, right? And that's very, and when I read that, I was like, wow. It's exactly what's happening today. And that's why so many of these guys can't figure it out. I mean, think about, have you ever seen some of these guys? Yeah, I actually did a speech on this. You talk about the red pill thing. I actually did a speech on this this, this summer about um, how, how the red pill can save your life. And, and as part of my speech, I'm researching all of these guys, the Alec Manassians, the George Sardinis, the, uh, I'm trying to think of any, any the names, are, they all come to me. There, there's so many, uh, oh, um, Jordan Peterson? Uh, not Jordan Peterson. Jordan, thank goodness, not Jordan Peterson. But uh, they're, they're, they're these guys that have committed these crimes. I, yeah. Oh, all oh, right, 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 right. These mass the killings. Yeah, the shooters. And you look at these guys, and my first thought when I seen every single one of these guys that I identified with, with the whole incel thing and say that's why they did it, and I'm like, you guys aren't bad-looking guys. I'm not saying you got model looks. But your looks are not preventing you from, from having uh, success with, with women, right? But they're, and, and you meet some of these guys, you see some of these guys' channels, and you look at them and go, they think they're ugly. And I'm looking, I'm like, dude, I know way uglier guys doing all right than you. And that's because we've gotten, we wanted to be so easy. That if some girl is in fun all over us, if we have a few bad strikeouts on Tinder, we think it's the end of the world. Well, some guys do. Not all. Not at all. But a lot of guys do because we don't have we don't have the ritual. Like, like you know, when I was a kid, for example, I'm 34. When I was a kid, we had to – what do we have? Not a kid, but I guess a young adult. 
we, we had to walk up to a girl. If we wanted to talk to her on the phone, we had to call during high school, and we had to ask one of our parents, usually the father, hey, can I speak to you? These are challenging, developing things, right? right but now right. think about today. Well, these, these guys don't have to do that. And so the, 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 and, and when you're younger, okay, whatever, right? But then you get older and you realize something. Your your uh, your spirit, I guess, for lack of a better term, your mental constitution, that's like a muscle, and you haven't used it. So the first time you get some blowback, you're like, whoa, I don't know. It, it crumples you. It, it beats you down. And I think that's what a lot of these guys are. Now, there's some guys that have legitimate reasons. Um, <clears throat> I think, anyhow, legitimate reasons for deciding to be like a MGTOW or whatever. They, they want to not do the dating game because they had some really bad experiences like uh, like divorce or family court. But a lot of these guys, and I like that, a lot of these guys are, are pretty much that scenario. They grew up, they're, you know, we're, we're going to say like post-1995 mm-hmm. kind of kids. Uh, so they never had to deal with the whole walk up to a girl and talk to her. They grew up with social media. They grew up with dating uh, apps. They grew up with texting. And they get the first bit of blowback because remember, that's another beautiful thing about this the era I'm from. Uh, we got to ignore and we got that rejection in our eyes and our face. Right. We had to like own that and deal with it. Walk away. Your homies clowns you and everything, right? Yeah. But, but it was cool because everybody was dealing with it. Now, you know, it's it's a very different world. And, and it's a weak world, and that, that weak world is making weak men. And I think that's the issue. As far as how to fix it. Which is way more important because you got to offer some some hope. How to fix it? Uh, it it, will, it we won't naturally fix it for the first time in history. I think uh, in human history, uh, our technology is so advanced that we will not naturally reset. We have to consciously make a decision, right? Well, you know, when when the, when the horse came out, for example, right. Uh, in place of, or, or even when automobiles, forget that, when automobiles came out in place of the car or in place of the horse, you got a whole generation of guys who had to learn how to deal with the factory, how to make those, whether they were repairing or they were uh, putting them together or they were, you know, working gas stations. You know, we, we had, we still had parts of society that require physical challenge. You got kids today, right? The the, the idea of blue collar work quite literally disgusts them. And I'm like, do you realize that this blue collar worker is clearing six figures a year and you got, you got six figures of debt for a $30,000 a year job. But that's how we think because we want it very easy. So right, what right. we're going to have to do is we're going to have to consciously step in to challenge. And that's another thing I took. If you want to, you know, link this back to, to, my idea of confidence and why I've developed and why I feel very confident, whatever I do. No one told me go to the boxing gym. Like, like, like no one forced me to do that. I walked in there uh, knowing that I was starting late in life and, and stuck with it. No one said go back to school uh, at all. Right. I decided to do that. And they certainly, you know, people tried to talk me out of going for a physics degree. It's a very difficult degree. Right. But these are challenges that I put myself through I, and you have to do it because because, look, no matter how easy the society is, we still, you know, I feel like I'm one of the more mentally healthy individuals, you know, hmm. but 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 that comes from the fact that I don't I, I try to get to the gym every or some form of the gym working out, uh, keep myself in shape. I, fasting is a great little practice. And why is fasting so popular? Okay, so sure, there's the dietary aspect of it and the idea of you can get cut up and shred up, but there's also a little challenge and people crave that. I really feel like people are tired of, I mean, they may not know they're tired. They may not know how to articulate it clearly, but I think the popularity of things, that are little things that I find somewhat annoying, but they're kind of cool, uh, I think, and useful, like Spartan races or intermittent fasting craze. I've always drank my coffee black, but black coffee or cold showers. That's an attempt to recreate hardship because right now right. we have, our, our poor people are good. Like if I was poor, like if I was in the projects right now in the United States, 
well, I would I would have a phone. I'd have a roof over my head. I'd have a thermostat. I'd have food. The I mean, like, I, well, how am I poor? I mean, yeah, there are people. I don't have as much as somebody in another neighborhood, sure. Right. But in terms of the basics, uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're way past that. We're, we're not quite post scarcity, but we're close enough to where it is it is causing a lot of harm. On the concept of confidence involves certain aspect of a little bit of arrogance, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of narcissism and things like that. That are, yeah. you know, on their own as words, they're looked down upon like, yeah, you don't want to be arrogant. No, don't be narcissistic and things like that. But how, do you, how would you make... Well, what are other things that you look at, for example, you know, besides, say, um, arrogance and narcissism to identify whether someone is confident or not? And how could someone develop those traits? Because I think it's all, it also has something to do with how people are raised these days, you know? Oh, for sure. This is kind of a, a very sensitive world right now. <laughs> so then, you know, it, it, it removes uh, the arrogance and then the, the narcissism that's important for yourself, you know, to be self-identifying and self-assured about yourself sometimes. Yeah, you know, one of the things I, I, I say is that to be, to be vulnerable, you have to be strong. Like, you can't be vulnerable if you aren't strong because that mm -hmm. means you open yourself up for attack and you have to be strong enough and capable enough to deal with that attack. <clears throat> now, now that explanation is, is a very sensible introduction of what I'm about to say where it gets a little more contradictory. But with, in comparing strength and vulnerability, uh, we can see two ideas that are somewhat opposed, right? Yeah. Vulnerability being weakness, strength being re our, our resistance. Uh, we can see how we, we step it up and apply that to confidence, kind of how this works. You have to be a little arrogant, a little narcissistic, right? Because, because I mean, the world's going to beat you down and you got to beat it right back and you got to hold that frame. You get that's really what it is. You got to be able to hold your frame against the world trying to influence you a certain way. With that said, you still live in the world with other people. And, and those people, even if they don't know it, are going to be part of the system that's trying to beat you down but you got to live with them and you, and you don't want to and you don't want to do any harm I'm a, I'm a big fan of like you know if you don't have to don't do any harm so you have to be humble and you have to have humility when you deal with people so, so how do we reconcile those ideas well you can only be humble you can only let yourself not take the credit not be the center of attention uh defer to people who know you may not necessarily have to defer to and and put yourself in a position to understand and really seem to be subservient but in this way you're helping and connecting you can only do that without feeling attacked you can only do that if you're truly confident when you're truly confident when you you know yeah if we focus only on the one pole yes arrogance narcissism um vanity all of those things absolutely but the other pole humility compassion right. empathy right but there are two different ends and that's what i mean confidence is this idea it is uh it's a combination of both you know what it's like it's like a bar magnet yeah the north and south poles they, they, they they're never right you know what you, you can never have a, a a monopole as i learned you can't just have a north pole or a south pole no matter how small you cut a magnet, it's going to have a north and a south pole. Right. And confidence is like that. Uh, there is always going to be that part that comes off as this braggart, as this super proud guy with so much hubris. But there's also going to be the guy that comes off as meek, that comes right. off humble, unassuming. And are these guys, uh, are they any different? No. It, it depends on when you catch them. It maybe, maybe the problem is, is is when what you know one extreme of those shows up too much. Right. Them, right. Oh it's yeah, you could. There's a there's a balancing act too because sometimes right. one is appropriate, one sometimes the other is appropriate. I think I think one of the greatest challenges for someone, especially when it comes to something like developing a, a confident kind of uh, frame for interacting with the world themselves, uh, one of the biggest challenges is to look and go, okay, 
these people, there's a mixed group. When it's just one, that's easy. But when there's a mixed group, it's it's being strong enough to stand out in front of the group, but likable enough for them to follow you. And that is a mix. That is a hard mix. But it only comes with experience. It's, it's like it's like um, a typical path that I think men go through. We start out being really nice, a lot of us, and we realize that gets us nowhere. And so we dial it up the other way, right. and we become assholes. And that gets us somewhere, but that shuts a lot of doors too. So we dial it down. But then we got to step it back up, and then eventually we, we, we get the groove, and then we, we find that where we're supposed to be. That, that's the thing. You know, uh, and, I, and I think of a sense of confidence, it takes time to develop. I would be, it's very, it's like, you ever, you ever meet a, uh, a pro athlete who's like 20 or 21 or an a performer? They're man, incredibly cocky, or on the other end, when you talk to some, some uh, musicians, incredibly humble. It's a weird thing thing the younger the the out the prodigy is yeah and you meet some of the older ones they, they've had enough time and enough experience and enough um <laughs> what do i say uh, uh enough runs against the wall uh to, to slow down and get right. it or I've been burned when they've been spent and so they order to get you know kind of tempers out but but i think when you're young uh, you, you're going to exist on one of the extremes, rare. And, and if you and if you somehow happen to be just in the middle, uh, there, there's probably not enough power to push you to be something great, right? Right. Uh, you need you need to be lean, push so hard. You're on one extreme, either very, you know, nah, you know, what I mean? Everyone's like, dude, we're looking at you. We know it's you. Like, take some, be confident, accept the compliment. Or the other, and like, it was all me, and I'm the greatest. And it just takes a little time up and down until you get it. Right. It reminds me of uh, uh, Josh Wetzkin, the, 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 the chess. Yes. I'm a, yeah. I'm a big fan, man. Big, yeah. big, I hope I get to meet him one day. It's uh, like his, 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 his story before, I mean, he was kind of a crazy prodigy, you know, wild and young. And now, you know, he went into martial arts and is one of the most calm guys you can ever find. And his book is kind of, you know, well thought out. Like a very one of my, f- it, it, whenever people ask me, oh, what are your favorite? I have, I have, th- Three books I always talk about. Mm. Uh, the Art of Learning is one of them. The Art of Learning is, is I think, a, a must-read for anyone who wants to become a, a – who wants to become good at their craft, for just, just from a skill perspective. Mm. But I liked what a reviewer said about it one day. They said, this is, this is a, a book about that, that, that teaches you how to think about how you think. And I was like, wow. You know that that's really awesome. Yeah, because because it is, and you just kind of follow his story and his journey, and see how you know it, it's the ups and the downs that that forge him, and it, it's really cool. I really love that book. Right. Uh, so next phase, uh, we can we should talk about. Uh, I think this is a very good trans transition. Actually, what we're talking about into the next section, which is not caring what other people think. You have written a book about that too. Ah, right? yes. Yeah, I, the the book is a collection of essays and, and key areas that I really had to change my thinking around uh, for to 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 I think be successful. You know, I, I always feel a little awkward. We were just talking about that 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 polarity of confidence, humble versus you know hubris, yeah. and and I always feel weird saying you know oh I'm successful, uh, and and I think I think I'm getting a little better at it, but. But yeah, uh, compared to where I was, pr- <laughs> definitely uh, successful. And what's cool about this is in that book, I write in the, the there are some very key areas: time management, my approach to hard work, my relationships, how I how I looked at the world in general, my relate with alcohol, you know, uh, which was which is the only kind of tangible topic of, of the ones in there. The rest are kind of most of them are like. Uh, intangible ideas to play with, and, and I, I have very had a had a very specific one about uh, the role of alcohol in your life. I, I just think it's a big thing, and, I'm a, and, and it's important to me. But those are the areas uh, where I, I got a lot of insight, and where I learned a lot about getting my life together. And when, and, and I just sat back and looked, and I was like, "Yeah, I have a lot to say about these things. Let's write these essays and help people get to that point where they're not so focused on the outcome." Because that's that's what it was for me. I was very much focused on how a thing looked 
rather than the process and and nothing will slow you nothing will keep you from becoming someone worth looking at than trying to be than trying to look a certain way much better to just focus on your own kind of process and path and your development and that's that's what i wanted to communicate in that book this is very interesting because if you actually put it on a, on a tangent and, uh, and think about it, if you try to care what other people think and who are you going to be exactly because there's just so many people in the world and they would right. want so many different things from you. You know, yeah. I, I think, you know, I think I'm one of the coolest cats you'll ever meet. I genuinely believe that. And I know I like, I have that confidence. I have that belief because I spent a lot of time, making the because because i know what it's like to make decisions based on approval and i know what it's like to make decisions based on self-respect and when you make a decision based on self-respect you, you're gonna get approval eventually when you make a decision based on approval only a small group of people are gonna approve of you and it's only gonna be for a short amount of time it is not lasting it's not it's like building your house on sand and if it, all it's gonna take is is a new trend and a new wind, time for you. If I was doing the same stuff at thirty, <laughs> at thirty-four that I was doing at twenty-seven, I'd be I'd be even bigger loser, right? Mm. So there's so many things that can blow that that house on that weak foundation of sand. That foundation being uh, outside approval for your actions, but when so, you make it. A there is a very extreme example of this, actually. I could use you as an example. So during your alcohol days, uh, you know, being an, alco uh, an alcoholic, maybe drinking, for example, a, a cider within the alcoholics would have been like a weak move, right? <laughs> so what are you doing? <laughs> oh, oh, dude, dude, it, it, it's so, you know, it was funny. I, I remember... I was still drinking when the song came out. Uh, Kendrick Lamar. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. I know uh, drink or something like that. Shots, yeah, shots yeah, yeah. whatever. Drink yeah, water or something. Go. Swimming pools. Yeah. Swimming pools. Like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, swimming pools. Right. Yeah. And uh, and he goes, and, and of course, he goes, why are you babysitting only two, uh, three or four shots? Uh, something, something turned up a notch. And I remember uh, I remember that that kid, that, that was like, I was like, wow, this guy gets it. That's crazy. Like either turn it up a notch or go or go home, kind of thing. Because what it turns into is you start trying to gain in respect. This is the most ignorant thing ever, man. Like looking back, I'm just like, wow, this is ridiculous. You start trying to gain the respect and and the admiration of mm -hmm. people who are trying to destroy themselves. Like they don't maybe they don't think of it so epically, but that's what it is. You know, alcohol in and of itself is already a poison. Granted, it's one that humans can tolerate to a degree, and those who can, kudos to them. But yeah. when you drink to the level that a lot of people, certainly in the United States, drink to, um, and then they're like, oh, you have to keep up, you have to match, because, you know, you people take pride in their drinking skills, or, or skills, I put that in air quotes, drinking skills, and you're like, oh, you know, I'll drink you under the table, I'll do that. Hey, dude, it, it, that is a very real, that sounds extreme to you. Mm -hmm. That is very real, though. Uh, a, and, and it's an issue I think a lot of people deal with. When I talk to people who are getting sober, they're like, oh, man, what are my friends going to think? They're going to want me to take a drink. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I get it because we've all been there. You know, I, I think one of the things that kept me from getting sober way longer than I should have uh, been is, is I, was, I was worried about the approval. So I another another example before you go ahead there is that um, so that was one extreme whereas you you don't want to seem weak and then there's also another extreme where you don't want to seem too overpowering like you know like the fear right. of branding people you know it's like just not being able to speak your mind because you, you'll be thinking like oh what are they going to think what are the others going to say if i speak like this you know which i think they're both extremes of um confidence you know the, like the balance that you mentioned like you need to be to be able to balance the two because you need those sides too it's like you know being able to say no without <laughs> worrying about you know who who is watching or who is thinking and also being able to speak your mind even when it it hurts you know as long as it's the truth right yeah and that's one of the man i'm telling you 
there comes a point, and and I, I I wish I had got it when I was younger, but I think getting it at you know is age appropriate now. Uh, <laughs> I, we all have to eventually get to the point where we're comfortable being who we are. Right. Like, like I, I'm at the point in my life where where let's pretend I go to like a barbecue with some new people, and they offer me a drink, and I'm like. No, nah, I don't drink. And they're like, oh, well, you know, what are you, pussy? I'd be like, I, I would look at, I would look at this guy like, are you, are you for real? Like, who are you? Like, because we're supposed, because that, that's how my frame is, and I think that's how a lot of us want to be. Where we, or when someone questions our lifestyle, it's like, what is wrong with you? You know, right. kind of deal. Especially if I'm not harming. So that's what we. Yeah, the, a lot of times, the bark of that pressure is worse than the bite. And we we make it so big because we're because we are. I mean, this is not a natural thing by any means. Humans are very much a social tribe, and when you do something different than the rest of the tribe, you're gonna have to have some strength. This is how it is, right? If everybody in your home drinks and everybody at the party drinks, and you've been brought up around drinkers, when you say I'm not drinking, you're going to get some flack. There's no way around that. But right. you got to build up some strength. And that's one of the things I talk about in my article is like uh, whenever you uh, – an article I have on my website related to drinking, but you could apply it to anything. Whenever you start a new habit that is contrary to the group that you're part of, your environment, you have got to develop that habit outside of the group. It, it's just going to come – it's going to get too much too much assault. You know what it would be like? It would be like trying to grow a new new tree – in a walking path. So many people are going to walk, 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 that the seedling is never going to have a chance to, to, to put the roots down and grow. After a certain point, it'll be fine. People just go around a tree or they'll stub their toe when they kick into it. But before then, it can easily be kicked out. So, but, so you have to let it get you, your habit, get its roots somewhere else before you put it back around the crowd. And once you have it around the crowd, yeah, you know, no one's going to be like, oh, there's a guy done drink. Like, yeah, so what? Right. But that's right. about any habit. It can be, it can be anything. And, and people, and, and you know what? This principle works for diet too, right? It, when you spend your time around a bunch of, I want to say fat people, but maybe not as healthy as you want to be. And they were like, yo, what are you doing, man? Are you no bread? I'm like, no, nah, man, no bread. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and and then and and instead of them giving you crap, you know, if your habit's strong enough with this, if your confidence with your nutrition is strong enough, you're not gonna cave in, right? But if it if it's new, you might. Yeah, you know, you know, those those kind of concepts are things that um uh that I always question myself, you know, when I see them playing out in society, like um, yeah. it, it could be, especially when, when I also look at um, the physical aspect of confidence, you know, being physically healthy makes you, gives you some points, you know, to become a lot more yeah. confident, right? You, but then you know, sometimes you see guys who do extremely well in that space. And then because of that, their defense I mean, that becomes everything to them. Like if, you, <laughs> if someone call him out, say, if you, you know, you're a well-built guy and some, some, you don't drink, somebody offers you alcohol and then they call you a pussy, the next thing you do, you want to fight. That kind of thing. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, that, that is also like a, a lack of confidence level. You know, it's a, the, 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 the loss of, of balance, so to, to speak. It's like one, you know, the, the, the physically confident and then you have the challenge maybe with the uh, the mental confidence, so to speak. You, you can't be unbalanced, man. And that's a, just a really big – that's really big to me in general mm. uh, is, 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 a, is an idea about – because, like, even even when, even when like, they say, oh, you got to be, like, moderation is – you know, everything in moderation, even moderation, right? Well, yeah. Well, even no, no matter how far you pull the rubber band, it eventually has to go back the other way. And the, no matter what, now you can pull it a lot at once, or you can pull it a little. But but that balancing act is it keeps you sane, it keeps you together, and it, and it really allows you. Well, that's right. Like, like that example you were talking about with the fight. I mean, what, what a what a ridiculous response that would be to be like, no, nah, bro, let's fight about it, right? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but at the same time, it would also be just as ridiculous. 
for you to be like, oh, okay, I know I haven't been drinking, but I'll drink because you offer me a drink, right? right? So, <laughs> so it's like uh, th- those are the extremes, and you have to be balanced in the middle. And and a lot of people, I, I say this a lot that there's a, a big challenge to be. You you have to be firm, but not an asshole, and you have to be polite, but not a doormat. And it really comes down to this overall strength and, and confidence. If you if you are confident in the decisions you're making for yourself, uh, it is it is going to be very easy for you to politely uh, decline or or enthusiastically accept. You know, some people worried about looking too cool. I'm like, nah, man, just just go with it and have fun. Whatever you're gonna do, but if you do it from a space of confidence. Then, then I think that it is very easy for a person to 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 build the life they want, free of whatever influences, uh, or, or rather, with or without any influences. But it all comes from doing it confidently. If you, if you don't if you don't move confidently in this world, somebody is going to is going to to pimp your mental state out, and they're gonna they're gonna make you part of their program, and it ain't gonna be for your benefit. So to, to refer to one of your articles uh, that you have on the website, you, 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 have, wrote, you have written about, uh, do you feel like a fraud? Uh, this is kind of a, a, an idea or a concept that I've had. I know a few people that I've had to deal with it, especially in the uh, thought leadership space or in the speaking uh, space where people would be like, you know, I feel like a fraud or something, you know? Right. Yeah. So at what point did you ever encountered to even care to write about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you do. You know, that never goes away, I think, to a degree. I mean, I, I've read there's a book by a woman named Amy Cuddy called Presence, where she talks about dealing with imposter syndrome. And I read that and I thought it was very interesting. And <clears throat> Imposter syndrome. So, so let's talk about first an actual imposter, right? Right. Uh, an imposter is is someone who pretends to be something else. Their exterior does not match their interior, or as you know, we say on the street, their front doesn't match their clout, right? Yeah. Uh, they they're not they all all sizzle no sauce that kind of thing, right? Okay. On, uh, imposter syndrome is like the complete opposite of this is where they are the real deal 100% right. and they don't believe it and that is so interesting to me uh, fortunately I, I, w- I would like to think you know in, in a lot of areas it's weird because in some areas I, I don't feel like that at all. I, I, it's weird. I feel I feel like I'm I'm an okay writer. Uh, there we go. Like and maybe I'm I'm better than okay. Maybe I'm not. I feel like I'm an okay writer. So I, like I, I don't look at my writing and go, man, uh, they're gonna come come uh, take away my writing license because I'm a fraud. You know. With that said, I mean, dude, I I felt like this about my my math i was like oh man when are you gonna find that i'm not that smart and they're gonna they're gonna like do something felt that way about boxing uh it it just it's weird i think there's certain things that for whatever reason um whether it be because i like i know why i had mine i had mine because i didn't feel like i was the you i was comparing myself to the absolute best there's a dangerous feel you know dangerous way because because when you do that, like by definition, you can't be in the top one percent of everything. Mm. It's just not possible, right? But when you do that, you start wondering, like, okay, you know, are they gonna are they gonna look and see that I'm not I'm not legit and I'm I don't really deserve to be here. I don't deserve any of this. A lot of it is people are very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable with, uh, I guess, criticism, competition, and what better way to divert attention from your accomplishments than to downplay them. If you, but you know, never take pride in what you've done. What, what, what I've realized is that it, it's actually the opposite of, it feels to me like it's the opposite of the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, and people that... <laughs> right, yeah. People that are really great, they end up feeling, you know, they 
being victim to the imposter syndrome. And those that are and really yeah. mostly, they tend to go along uh, the lines of the Dunning Kruger effect. So I think it's kind of a healthy thing for someone who is constantly improving themselves, you know, because you're always it's, it's questioning really, things all the time. It's really weird, you know. So, so I used to wonder why being a leader was such a, or why, why they put such a high premium on leadership. Like, like it just, for, for me, it seems like if, if you spend enough time doing something, you should be a leader in it, right? That That's how I used to think. Hmm. Now I understand that there is something unique about a person to have a high degree of confidence, but a low degree of doubt. That is not a, for, for whatever reason, whether it's a, a feature or a bug of human nature, the, the two don't normally come together. Certainly not coupled with a healthy dose of humility and introspection. So it's, you know, we're back to that extreme thing on top of uh, a person's actual capabilities versus the appearance of their capabilities. Because because what is, what's part of being a good leader? A good leader has to take an accurate objective assessment of their abilities or a situation and then take a course of action and act confidently in it, even if the odds are are overwhelmingly against or in favor of them, right? Uh, so, so we take that idea and we go, all right, man, why, why, why don't we have so many good leaders? Because, because either the leaders are not good at what they do and they just want to be in front, kind of like the you know people who want to be politicians or right. want to be teachers, but as opposed to learners, or the people who are really good have no desire to have responsibility uh, for the direction of a thing. And to get those two things in one person, I think is a very, very hard, so to the point where they, they compensate ridiculously for a leader. Right. Uh, and, and, and good leader, and, and here's how, and they have to, why? Because a, a good leader gets headhunted. Everyone comes and goes, I want to take that guy, take that person, take that person. So they have to compete to keep these people around in one way, uh, shape or the other. So the imposter syndrome, if, if I think that's one of those things to, we have the a subtle, like maybe second order effect of this this comfortable society. That okay, so so now we have the issue. We, we don't have anything hard to push back against. You know, no one's fighting bears. No one's got to worry about food. No one's got to worry about heat. Whatever. Now we get to focus on psychological things. Okay, right. Uh, on the flip side, we get to worry about how we feel about something to the point where it can depress us. Or we get to like question our own abilities to survive and flourish to the point where it paralyzes our activity. And so the next thing to push against is all mental and psychic, right? It's like, okay, well, I got to overcome this imposter syndrome. That's the hardest thing about writing is, is you have to put these words down and then go, all right. I think a lot of people, they, they have to like this. Like, if you're going to make any kind of living, even as just a blogger, like like what I do, basic blogging, well, you know, I need to have enough traffic to sustain myself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, <laughs> and, like, uh, that means I have to write well. And the thing about how arrogant that is, to go, I'm going to put these words on paper, and enough people are going to read it. A lot of people can't do it. And even I can't do it. The difference, or rather even I don't do it comfortably, the difference is like you just take action. That's really the only thing that you can right, do right. is take action. Because at the end of the day, all of these things, they don't – how you think is important, right? Let's not <laughs> yeah, you're right. You, you are, but you're right. at the end of the day, the effect that you have on the world, one, that's your goal to have an effect. Two, that's what you're going to be judged by. No one's going to go, man, that guy was a great thinker. Like, like who cares? Like, tons of people were great thinkers. The, the only reason why we know about it, any great thinker is because they actually did something with that thought. Right. You know, imagine if Leonardo just sat there just doodling, right, and, and had no desire to, to create any of these inventions and war machines and, and, mo and modern for that period of time upgrade. Right, but but we know him as a great thinker. I'm, maybe there were tons of people who thought just like him. So that's our our that's the only way to move past it. I think for imposter syndrome.
is to just take action. And that's certainly what I've done every, every time. And I think boxing kind of trains you and helps you with that because everyone's like, like no one is not terrified when they get in the ring. I don't care what anyone says, certainly not in the heavyweight division with like 200 plus pound guys slinging hard leather design to hurt you and been trained to do it. Now, everyone's terrified of that, but you take action. Action is the way through imposter syndrome. Action is the way through low confidence. That is the 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 remedy for for all I think issues of your mental condition. Yeah, man, that that was great. Um, it's a uh, it's. I mean, I've dealt with that myself when I when I started the podcast. Pretty much in everything that I started in the last few years, and right. I think one of the greatest things. To, to to overcome it is just success. You know, the more things you do, you become more successful. Right. The, and you just stop caring, you know, over time. You're like, okay, really, who, who cares? Because also you, you look back and like, okay, someone who would say if you're a, a writer and you have written four or five books and then somebody is criticizing your book online, yeah, you'll be like, okay, so this guy who is criticizing my book, he doesn't have any himself. <laughs> Right, right, that's one thing. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. I remember Grant Cardone. Um, I don't know if you know the guy. He's kind of yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. One of my favorite people. You know, uh, uh, I like. I like that guy a lot. So he said uh, he wrote his first book in three hours. You know, based on the experience and knowledge that he had in the sales business, and he put it out. Um, he had another. He had a publisher. Uh, I think it was uh, Random Audio or Penguin Books. A deal with them, but they were taking three months just to put a book out. So he wrote another one called, called a booklet because of his contract with them, just to kind of circumvent his contract with them, which would not allow him to write another book before the other one was published. So he wrote a booklet uh, within three hours, published it, and it sold. And then he was doing a book tour, and then people were coming to him and say, hey, you, there was a mistake here, a gram, grammatical er, error in your writing, and this and this. So he's like, hey, <laughs> uh, you care about that, but it, it just became a bestseller, bitch. <laughs> so what's the hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know what's funny about that, man? Um, I went through, because my not caring what other people think is, is very much a self-published effort, and I had no help when I did it. And I, I couldn't afford the help. I was it was in a, in a rough spot. I finished it, and uh, and it's gone on to really change my life. But every now and then, I'll look through it, or I'll look at a review. Man, yeah, there's, there's typos in there. Hey, I, I did like I did my best to catch them, but I had to just get out there. Now, sober letters that is clean. Like that is a top notch product because I had top notch help and and uh, and money to to put into it. But like. It, it's it's so interesting that people when I talk to people about going after uh, what they want and and in particular things like writing or, or starting a, uh, a YouTube channel or whatever and I'm like dude you gotta understand the odds just the odds aren't in your favor you have to kind of accept that right. like like no realistically no one's gonna care what you have to say like so if you if you just kind of internalize that then you can move forward because you know what that does that gets rid of you focusing on the outcome. Right. That means, right. Like I, I, I think back to all the, I think through all the iterations on my website and it's growth and all that. And I go, wow. And it's a really, like, it's a good website now. Like it's, it's got some, it's got domain authority. Right. It's got backlinks. It, it, it doesn't look bad. The information is good. People find it through Google, not just me putting stuff on Twitter. Mm. But I think about this and I go, well, well, realistically, you know, I've been at this for five years blogging. And most of that time, no one noticed her. Like you can see the traffic. Most of that time, no one cared, right? Right. And still, in the grand scheme of things, no one cares. Like, if we take, I think I got like 100, we'll just round it up and make it even. 100,000 page views a month. A lot of those is repeat visitors, and there's 7 billion people on the planet. So, we're talking less than 1%. Right. <laughs> less than 1% of the population cares about writing, right? But uh, why, why do you do the thing? Do you do it for you? Do you do mm. it for the process? Or do you do it because you care what other people think? Yeah. Uh, I've just reached at a point now where uh, I just don't care, really. Like, 
uh, I used to edit a lot of my podcasts or videos quite a lot at the beginning. Now, you know, the more mistakes are there, I just really want to put it out like that the way it is. You know, it's like, yeah. there's also the skin in the, I don't know if you read Skin in the Game. I did. That yeah. is a, I'm a big fan of that book. And it's like, I think the more mistakes sometimes you put out also, especially when in the content creation, in the kind of community business, it kind of makes you more relatable as well to a lot of people. Right. Yeah. Because the, the, that, that humanity, um, everyone, it, it's, it's weird. We get this weird relationship with, with, with our, with our heroes. We, we want to be like them because we consider ourselves uh, beneath them, whether that's true or not. We look up to them, which means by definition, right. we have to consider ourselves uh, in one area, at least beneath them. However, we want to feel like we can, we, we can touch them. If it, if it's something like, like, like this, for example, uh, it, this isn't like, you know, dunking on somebody from, from the free, free throw line. Like with the people maybe look at you and they go, man, that guy's just got some equipment and the internet. I can do it too. Yeah. And, right. And, and what's crazy is they can. Okay. Whether they, the degree of success they have is, right. is another story entirely, but that's kind of the point is that they don't know what degree of success they can have, but they can see there's no real reason why they can't have your level of success. Right. So when they see you make the mistake, when they see the errors, when they see the, you know, maybe you make a mistake in editing or something, they go, you know what? That guy's last podcast was shit. Did you see all those typos in that last piece? Right. If he's doing those numbers, making those, I can do it too. And in right. that way, you kind of accidentally motivate people. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, you actually, uh, the, the more wrong something is, it just creates um, kind of engagement sometimes, which yes. is good too, because it's either you put something too perfect that nobody cares because they just steal the information and they go deal with it, or there will be something there that actually strikes a conversation in whichever direction it goes. It's none of your business. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right, man. So uh, yeah, it's been an hour already. I don't want to keep you for too long. But thank, oh, no thank you so much for, for your time, man. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you again, man, for having me, having me back for part two, I guess. Awesome. Yeah. Can we do this again sometime when we need you? A absolutely, man. I had a, you, you're, you're a great host. For sure, man. Thanks so much. I uh, enjoy Portugal and everything in Europe. I will do my best. Cheers, man. S see you, man.